Hi, it's Mind Rolling, and uh, my bestie is here today, Mr. David Silver. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good morning, Hello. Vietnam. It's kind of oh, like yeah. that. You remember that picture with Robin Williams? Yeah, I certainly do. Yeah, today he could, if he was alive, he'd be, yeah. Good morning. We could substitute Vietnam for other things, but you know. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I saw this documentary about Robin Williams, and he was such an amazing human being. Mm. And sad. I, I don't usually get sad when people die. You know that I don't know really, except for maybe people like, I don't know, Tom Petty or. Uh, great masters yeah but you know when i saw this film about him he was just such an an unusual and special person very compassionate and thoughtful and sweet anyway so hi hi long time not that long but we're doing them now every couple of months i guess yeah whenever i can catch you but uh well yeah (laughs) so to speak (laughs) huh i mean i'm so incredibly busy right now yes i know (laughs) not (laughs) Uh, just so everybody knows, David, I don't want to get into it and I don't want to embarrass you, but he had a, a major injury, which uh, he's recovering from, that is a terrible uh, broken wrist, I mean, in 20 places. So, so that set him back on the movie he's doing, on the book he's writing, and all of it for the moment. Um, but he's become an expert on uh, documentaries on Netflix, so that's <laughs> worth something as well. Um And now, what about this thing? It's funny. You know, I texted you yesterday. I love this. I saw this on social media. Everybody, we got to be thinking about what are we going to do to save the environment so that Keith Richards can still be with us? (laughs) Something like that. That was the greatest thing I'd read in a long time. You know, he and I are exactly the same. I mean, like two months apart or something. Oh, birthday? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm the same age as all those iconic, you know, British invasion. Oh, really? Well, you're the Gangster, British invasion. Gangsters <laughs> from yeah. 1967. Yeah. And I think there was something in the water that either killed us off, like, fast, when we were 27, uh, and everybody yeah. them, or we're still alive. And uh, Yeah, Keith Richards. You know, he's kind of, um, I, I don't know him, but I do know people who do know him, and He's given up almost everything except smoking cigarettes, and and which could be the worst thing of all. <laughs> yeah, really. But, except yeah. cigarettes. That's great. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, okay. All right. So uh, today we decided that uh, we uh, were going to do uh, we'll just chat about Carl Jung, and uh, since we've been experts on Jung for many, many, many years. <laughs> 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 oh shit! I had I went I told this to Dave the other day, but uh, last weekend I went out with some people and a couple of them I didn't know we had to dinner and everything. And in the course of the conversation, he says to me, uh, and I don't know how he got around to this, but he's been in a a young you know there are young study groups something in almost every major city. I mean it's amazing. So. In this case, he said, yeah, I've been, like, for 15 years, I've been part of this study group. And I stupidly said, well, my partner and I are going to be doing a a podcast about (laughs) Jung as if we had been studying it for 30 years and had become masters. And then then they said, well, what's it about? And that's when I laughed and went, just kidding, just kidding. We're just going to rap. We don't know anything about Jung. (laughs) No, we're going to talk about Keith Richards. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) <laughs> oh well, boy! You know, oh boy! We've done some studying up, and um, I know you have. And uh, very fortunately, I got a present of the Red Book, which we'll talk about later, uh, some years ago, and um, didn't really read it. But now I'm reading it. And the only problem with it, I can't pick it up because of my wrist. <laughs> yes, so I, I, I have fun. to bring in, you know, a butler to pick <laughs> up a butler to pick now. the book up. Amazing! You know? uh, it's a huge book. It's. Yeah. it's very large and uh, well, we'll uh, talk about it we'll talk about it can you just say you know just so long as uh, you know because we really are neophyte i mean i'm talking about i found uh and, and david's been he'll tell you what the red book is but it came out recently in the last oh, i don't know five six years ago uh and which is a compendium of 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 some of his work i got a book called the psychology of kundalini yoga because i'm interested in yoga as a general thing 
and seeing if we can break it down into a, a way we can understand it uh, in a very practical sense. And so I found this, so this book has an amazing lens from which Jung looked at kundalini yoga. He actually went to India. I'll read you one passage, David. You'll die. <laughs> what happened to him? Yeah, he, uh, he barely survived. Uh, but so, yeah, the, the, the way in which he interprets the, the kundalini, the chakra system, and so on, uh, through that lens is unique. And so I think, uh, I think, you know, we can get something out of it. I did, and, you know, I love sharing with whatever I kind of, come upon in this area but maybe you could just say a little small not a big biography of, of Jung. oh well um yeah for for those and I, I imagine there aren't many of them because of the demographic of mind rolling but um you uh, Carl Gustav Jung was Swiss and um he uh he was a, a student of psychology at university and worked at a psychiatric hospital in 1900, hmm. the turn of the century, you know? Oh, yeah. And then uh, he became connected with Freud, Sigmund Freud, and um, they became kind of partners, um, but they had eventually found out they had diametrically different views of the of the source of consciousness and of the source of motivation, I guess is what I, how I'd put it. I'm not reading that, by the way. I made that up. <laughs> um, but they were friends until 1912. And then, uh, and by that time, Freud was quite well known, uh, Jung less so. And Jung uh, wrote a book called The Van Jungen und Symboli der Libido, which is, means psychology of the unconscious, uh, which was the thing that divided them. Because, as you probably know, uh, there, uh, Freud, you know, ascribed much motivation to deep sexualities, and um, even though I don't think Jung disagreed with the place of sexuality in motivation and behavior, he didn't think that, uh, and developed a much more wide-ranging uh, and deeper view, I think, which was of the collective unconscious and of consciousness in particular. And um, it, it, it seems weird, but when you think about rock and roll bands that break up, and you think they never could, uh, this is what it was like. They were, you know, Freud and Jung, Jung and Freud. And then this particular difference became bitter. And they, they weren't exactly enemies, but they were certainly not friends anymore. And the, the two streams of, of, of uh, psychology and, and psychotherapy diverged at that point. And... You know, I think the United States was where it all began to happen more than Europe in a way. And uh, Jung became uh, a student of consciousness and has had an enormous impact, impact upon the last century. And actually, uh, certainly upon students of consciousness and uh, yoga and new age, for a better expression, people since the 60s and 70s. So Jung talked about the soul and Freud tended more to talk about the id and the libido and yeah. the ego. Yeah. So that's, you know. Now, uh, they broke up in 1912, 1913. His big book, The Red Book, which I'll talk about later because I have one, um, was written between 1915 and 1930. It took him 15 years to complete it. And it's much more an inquiry of the unconscious and the, the shadow conscious and uh, is very, very parallel in many ways to Eastern philosophy, thought, and, and um, you know, practice. Mm. So that's, that, that's my rather elongated <laughs> biography. Yeah, no, that's, uh, and I don't know if you have, but as you are speaking, uh, I just, uh, about Jung's history, I just thought uh, I myself took advantage quite some time ago, of a Jungian therapist in Los Angeles. And he was highly unusual because, and it just shows you the connection between what it is, for instance, you and I are interested in the East and the yogas of the East uh, in, in all of their variations, using that in a very general way. And the fact that Jung was so connected to that in, in his own way and very interested in it. 
uh, I think that that's uh, a very, very uh, telling thing. And in, in particular, with this therapist, there was a kind of openness that I will never forget, actually. It's the one thing I remember. He was an older guy. You know, I was, uh, I don't know, maybe mid-40s at the time, 50. Uh, and uh, he, I, of course, told him about everything, my history in India, my relationship with my guru, Neem Karoli Baba, the whole thing. And he was not overtly into any Eastern thing. He was just open. Hmm. And you know what he used to do? He'd say, okay, you sit down actually lie down, if I remember. And he'd say, well, let's bring Maharaji into the room and let's meditate with him and, and then we'll see what he has to say. Really? Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And, that, that and it became amazing. so present and real. Hmm. Uh, he was a very, very unusual man. And uh, so I had a great feeling from that time. I really didn't know much about Jung. You know, I mean, just the stuff you said around the unconscious, around uh, the uh, the working with, which I love, of course, around dreams and, and all of the symbolism therein and so on. So uh, so that's why I've, I've had this little thing about, you know, we've talked about doing this, uh, you know, uh, for a long time. So I'm mm -hmm. glad we are. So maybe you take the uh, first stab at uh, whatever it is you think might edify. Well, one of the things that occurred to me quickly in, in thinking about this since you suggested doing it was the really um, clear parallels and resemblances between uh, some of the things that Ramdas has consistently talked about and expanded upon. And... Um, and, and Jung, and particularly in, in connection with the soul. Mm. And not just as there being a soul, um, because obviously, um, although Ramdas is always very lucid and accessible, he's also extraordinarily um, deep and, and insightful and sometimes complex in his sort of deconstruction of, of what we believe about ourselves. And I think Jung was very similar. And um, I, I'd like to point out one, it might take me a second to find it, but mm. there's something that he wrote in the Red Book, um, which, I mean, tons of stuff which relates to this. Uh, one, of the, one of which, uh, let's just go back a moment to when Ramdas departed Harvard as Dr. Richard Alpert, uh, a clinical psychologist of great repute, and became involved in psychedelics, but then I think more crucially became involved with Maharaji and Karoli Baba and, and Indian philosophy, but not just philosophy, uh, philosophy, but behavior and attitude towards the world. And, and I just want to read this thing. In the Red Book, uh, Carl Jung said, the spirit of the depths, the spirit of the depths, which sort of means the soul, forced me to say this, and at the same time to undergo it against myself, since I had not expected it. I still labored misguidedly under the spirit of this time, as opposed to the spirit of the depths, and thought differently about the human soul. I thought and spoke much of the soul. I knew many learned words for her. I had judged her and turned her into a scientific object. I did not consider that my soul cannot be the object of my judgment and knowledge, much more are my judgment and knowledge the objects of my soul. Therefore, the spirit of the depths forced me to speak to my soul, to call upon her as a living and self-existing being. I had to become aware that I'd lost my soul. Hmm. From this, we learn how the spirit of the depths considers the soul. He sees her as a living and self-existing being. And with this, he contradicts the spirit of this time for whom the soul is a thing dependent on man, which lets herself be judged and arranged, and whose circum circumference we can grasp. I had to accept that what I'd previously called my soul was not at all my soul, but a dead system. Mm -hmm. Hence, I had to speak to my soul as to something far off and unknown, which did not exist through me, but through whom I existed. Mm. And I think uh, you wow. should talk, try and, uh, if, if you want, 
to connect that with with Ramdas's um, distinction between the role and the soul. What Jung is talking about, the spirit of the time is the role. Yeah. You know, that we think we're, we're terrible people if we don't succeed. Uh, I had a conversation with someone a couple of days ago who was very depressed because he feels like he hasn't made enough money in his life, and he hasn't, to, to really support himself the way he wants to be, and hasn't done enough and hasn't achieved enough and so forth. And he's a meditator, and I, I very sanctimoniously said, well, who the fuck cares? You're going to be dead soon. And okay, what, what you didn't it? say that like that to that guy. <laughs> I did because I've known him for oh, really? two years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, that's the way we talk. And uh-huh. but basically, what I what I was saying to him was, I don't care that you, you're not rich, and I don't care that you haven't published tons of books. I really don't. I love you as a person, and therefore, I, you know, I love your soul really. And what the spirit of the time to Jung was, mm-hmm. it seems to me, was not really what we call the spirit of zeitgeist. No, to him, the spirit of the time was just that. I've got to vote, I've got to make money, I've got to have children, I've got to eat correctly, I've got to wear these kinds of clothes, and I've got to have that kind of car, and I don't want to do this, and I don't like that person, and I don't like that political party, and blah, 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 forever. And mm. that's the spirit of the time for Jung. Uh, and therefore, he considered himself to be correctly mad. And it was his madness to him was sanity, because as soon as he entered the divine madness, and he called it the divine madness, uh, he was encountering his soul and those of others. It's it's funny the way he you put that. His madness was his sanity, right? And he, yes. he ended up recognizing that. Uh, I did a podcast recently, and I, I, I've been talking about this because it was so great, uh, with Adi Ashanti, who's a, a wonderful teacher out there. Anyhow, he told me about how when he was a kid and he kept looking at his all the adults around him, parents and everybody else, and saw how absolutely caught they were. And they were shouting at each other. There was anger. They were drinking. Whatever they were doing, it was completely out of mind. And he, so he kept wondering, well, why? What is going You know, he, it really was intense for him until he finally said, yeah, I know. They're insane. And I'm so. Then he set out to find out who he really was, uh, in the midst of these of this insanity. So it's a little bit of a, a similar thing, except put in a different way. Which is why yeah, Jung is so great. And I think the depths, when you talked about he he talked about the depths from which he could then connect with his soul, something like that, right? So the depths may be uh, Ramdas's witness from the place, non-ego, non-mind, non-duality, witness, non-judging, witness from that place, uh, connect with the uh, true true self, soul, whatever you want to call it. Um, in, in this book, by the way, uh, actually f- from his book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, Jung recounted how during his confrontation with the unconscious, which is kind of what we're referring to, around the time of the First World War, He said, I was frequently so wrought up that I had to eliminate the emotions through yoga practice. Can you believe that? Yeah. Okay. But since it was my purpose to learn what was going on within myself, I would do them only until I had calmed myself and could take up again the work with the unconscious. So he was using one-pointedness and so on to be able to, you know, it's funny. Yeah, there's it's a, what a, what a parallel. I mean, given the time we're talking about there, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, th- uh, this book in particular was is from talks he gave thirty one, thirty two, nineteen thirty one, thirty two. So, mm-hmm. pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, this madness part of it, you know, you can imagine how much more, you know, he felt alone uh, about it, because you know he grew up really in in a Victorian Edwardian aftermath and. You know, then had the First World War, I mean, in which he served on some level, um, and and saw massive destruction and suffering and horror, which was only could ever be, you know, maybe the Armenian massacres and the Second World War, of course, were equally awful. Uh, and and you know, he then began to develop the idea of the shadow and that we all have this darkness within us for whatever reasons, whatever atavistic reasons, whatever biological reasons. Uh, we, we, we cannot point the finger. 
And he even went so far as to say that wars were caused by man, and he meant man and woman, uh, not confronting the shadow in themselves and having to kill other people to see if they could destroy it. So instead of destroying by self-awareness, um, the shadow and darkness of violence and revenge and, mm. you know, all of that that we, we carry um, in our cells and DNA, we didn't, as far as he was concerned, we didn't recognize that ever. And therefore wars are the spine of our era. And he's talking about everything from, you know, from pre-Christian times. Um, and so he's saying, what is it, what are we doing here? We're killing heroes, which is something he said all the time in wars, instead of, of you know, sort of completely incisively and honestly looking to ourselves for what we were really about. And if I had to name, you know, and I mean, Ramdas is great on this, but he's not the only one. Um, clearly, in the last 50 years, uh, you know, everything from music to art to, you know, to philosophy to spiritual practice is about trying to establish in ourselves what is true and thereby not being hypocritical and thereby not judging all the time mm. and saying, I'm good, you're bad. England good, Germany bad. And it's hard to do this because when you think about it, in World War II, who was it that, that you know, killed six million Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and people with physical challenges? It was the Germans uh, and the Japanese. It, we say it wasn't the English, it wasn't the Americans. How, and how difficult it was for him to, to establish that those wars were not, they were, they ended up in that kind of divisiveness, but they started from internal denial and the reaching out to something else, to the other, to destroy it and therefore to bring good, which I am, say, mm -hmm. I'm good, they're bad, let me kill them and everything will be fine. And we see in, 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 in the 21st century that yeah, well, didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. Not really, it's yeah. uh, it's rearing its head, even more so. The polarization that's going on now is pretty uh, alarming, basically. But, well, yes. I mean, I saw children yesterday at a Trump rally, and um, you know, in the front row, he'd put them, blonde seven or eight, nine year olds, you know, and they just looked. They di they weren't laughing, or they didn't understand what he was saying. They just looked as if they were in a cult of some very deep, divisive, cruel, antagonistic order. Children, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, this has been uh, going on. I mean, another podcast I just did with uh, a teacher named Gangaji, also a wonderful teacher. Um, and she said to me, this racism, I've seen what, What's happened with me? I grew up in Mississippi, I think in Missouri or Mississippi in the South, and that was in, endemic to my family. And I didn't even think I, there was any other way of thinking mm. until obviously I became, uh, you know, an adult and in the process of my own self inquiry realized the extent of ignorance that I was living on. You know, that was part of me back then. It's not. We look at sort of objectively, but it's so subjective to the person who's growing up in this environment. I mean, it's just, uh, I was blown away when she said that. Because, I mean, she's a tremendously conscious person that just happened to come up in that environment. And it was nothing more or less. Right. By the way, right. uh, Jung, um, we talked about sort of his salvation was his madness. And he started to believe in his madness, not his sanity, right? But... Jung claimed that the symbolism of kundalini yoga suggested that the bizarre symptomatology, symptomatology that patients at times presented actually resulted from the awakening of kundalini. I've always thought this. He argued hmm. that knowledge of such symbolism enabled much that would otherwise be seen, seen as the meaningless byproducts of a disease process to be understood as meaningful symbolic processes and explicated the often peculiar physical localizations of the symptoms. Hmm. And if you go around India, people 
when they start to have, you know, they, if they, they, they open up, different chakras open up, right? We're going to talk about that to get an idea of, of what, uh, what we're talking about in terms of the, the uh, psychic centers in the body, which is what Kundalini Yoga is. There's seven of them. Uh, and you, you can see this manifest. It just walk, they don't put them in nut houses, though. We put them in nut houses. When, when this stuff, it manifests here, and, and people start speaking in tongues or they, they manifest really bizarre physical behavior. Uh, you know, also they get very sick. I mean, all sorts of things happen. Uh, and, of course, India being India uh, accommodates everyone <laughs> without a problem. Um, so, uh, the, in, in fact, do you remember R.D. Lang? Oh, Yes. Yeah, he was uh, actually. We met him in India. He's a good friend of Ramdas. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I read his books and was very taken by him. For yeah, he said time. that Jung's view that so-called pathological experiences may actually be mis- misrecognized experiences of the arousal of Kundalini is confirmed and uh, developed by uh, this man Lee Sanella in uh, the Kundalini experience: psychosis or transcendence. This book was published in '92. I wonder if we can get some of these books. Jeez, you know. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's difficult because, you know, I was in Manhattan um, a few days ago, walking up Third Avenue, I, th- I guess, and um, it was at a time when not everybody's coming out of their offices, and and you know, countless people in in suits and ties in 95 degrees, 92 percent humidity, and walking around quickly to the subway or to a Uber or whatever, and I came across in in sixteen blocks three people who were clearly what normal so called normal people would call uh, insane, mm. and it just struck me, you know, who's insane here? I mean, these guys are walking in horrendously humid and hot weather in the middle of a concrete jungle, wearing a suit and a tie, and obviously, and most of them on the phone. And if you just, as Jung says, if you just take your, take away from the conventional vision of normalcy to the soul, which occasionally I do because I don't spend that much time in Manhattan. So when I'm walking around, I go, my goodness, these people are crazy. They're crazy. They're going into an office to manipulate financial blocks. And then they're going out on, in, a, in a car commuting for 90 minutes to Westchester. And then they're doing the same thing again and again and again and again for 40 to 50 years. And we, do, and we can say, well, that's crazy and everything, but most of us accept these systems. We do because we partake in them. We buy from Amazon. We put gas in the car. We watch television. We have political debates. We wear a tie. We don't wear a tie. And what I think Jung is so great about is that the real zeitgeist is unchanging, eternal, and forever within us. But the thing that we call the zeitgeist is, is, is just that. It's what is, what is fashionably conscious now? Uh, not really conscious, but what are the trends? Trends are, you know, we all do it. You know, buy from Amazon relentlessly, despite the fact that we know the working conditions at Amazon are poor and all of that. But we're all Amazon. I don't know one single person in my milieu who doesn't buy everything from Amazon. <laughs> And, you know, I admit it, and I, I don't think it's politically correct, uh, and it's a little crazy, really. But all these things we sort of accept as progress and life being made more comfortable for us. And um, is that what we're supposed to be doing? Mm. Apparently it is because we're all doing it. But then when you go to India or, or other places too, Asheville, for instance, <laughs> you see people with a somewhat, uh, well, you know, places where artists and meditators, and I don't want to sound elitist here, but it, it is a fact that people of a certain kind seem to go to the spirit of the depths as a daily way of living, um, you know, uh, and, and, and can become anything from sannyasis to set therapists to painters to musicians to bums. And and they feel that they are living the life they're supposed to be living, mm. not this, not this structured, um, supposed scientifically observant and objective lifestyle. Mm. 
where Elon Musk is a much more important figure than, um, than Ram Dass. And I don't believe that to be true. But, it, you know, there was a time in my life when I, you know, thought, well... Well, there... science is king still. And uh, although inroads are being made to prove that uh, what the Tibetans have been doing for centuries in terms of their inner science is proving out to be uh, factual. Uh, right. There, there's a fun thing here. Maybe I shouldn't have used the word science. I should have used the word social or mm. societal. Yeah, right. Um, so Jung went to India, right? Yeah. He says, so, um, he says, as we would go through the temples of Kali, which were numerous at almost every Hindu city, we saw the en- evidence of animal sacrifice. You know, back in the earlier part of last century, they were still doing that. The places were filthy, dirty, dried blood on the floor and lots of remains of red betel nut all around, which is still there to this day, everywhere, so that the color red was associated with destructiveness. Concurrently in Calcutta, Jung began to have a series of dreams in which the color red was stressed. It wasn't long before dysentery overcame Dr. Jung, uh, and I had to take him to the English hospital at Calcutta. So that's what happened when he went. A more lasting effect, though, of this impression, impression of the destructiveness, destructiveness of Kali was the emotional foundation it gave him. This is fantastic, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the conviction that evil was not a negative thing, but a positive thing. Mm-hmm. The influence of that experience in India, to my mind, was very great on Jung in his later years. I mean, wow. I mean, he got Kali. You know, you have to... Destruction has to happen before uh, Phoenix can rise, right? Before anything new, which is the whole thing around impermanence and so on. So uh, he he also said, by the way, um, about what uh, uh, yoga means in the west and not we're not talking about phys- hatha yoga you know, we're talking about the yoga which en- encompasses uh, all of the you know the eight limbs of yoga uh, he said i can say however something about what it means for the west our lack this is terrific <laughs> our lack of direction borders on psychic anarchy <laughs> therefore any religious or philosophical practice amounts to a psychological discipline. So he put it all in psychological terms, right? And therefore, a method of psychic hygiene. We need more psychic hygiene, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Oh, that's amazing. You know, I well, everything that he said was controversial because it, it challenged, again, conventional wisdom. It even challenged Freud, who wasn't really conventional wisdom yet. But he didn't care. Jung said, no, that's, you're coming from the wrong place, Sigmund. And can you imagine that conversation? Because Sigmund. Um, you know, Sigmund was not exactly a, 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 a wilting flower. You know, I mean, he, he, he had his beliefs and he, he totally believed in them. But I, something, I, I, again, from the Red Book I wanted to read, which is interesting to me, which connects. He says in the Red Book, everything to come, meaning everything, was already in images. To find their soul, the ancients went into the desert. This is an image. The ancients lived their symbols since the world had not yet become real for them. Thus, they went into the solitude of the desert to teach us that the place of the soul is a lonely desert. Now, what he's saying is that without faith in the truth of this pure soul, of this oversoul, uh, you know, you, you, you end up in a desire system where the desire itself is not examined, but the things and whatever are, are pursued relentlessly. And he's saying that that atavistic truth of the ancients, seeing the world around them as being not real, which is kind of what we are now yeah sort of realizing in terms of Maya, in terms of quantum physics, in terms of, as you said before, you know, impermanence. He's saying in, in 
the origins of, of Homo sapiens, their world was actually interior. It was what, mm. they, what they felt was what they really believed that they should, uh, was the fulcrum of their life. And what they saw outside was just some dreamlike ephemeral mm. uh, thing, not to be taken as anything but symbology of what was the inner truth. The exact opposite of what Western yeah. post yeah. Cartesian, post Cartesian reality, cogito ergo sum. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it, he was saying no cogito no bullshit. It's not. I think therefore, therefore I am. It's more I am because I am, mm. like um, Saga data or yeah, any I am that I am. Yeah. Yeah, and and. So, so in that sense, Jung was such a visionary. I mean, he wasn't just a Westerner. He was a Swiss, which is, you know, like the most ordered place I've ever been in. I mean, you know, when I was in uh, in VV uh, for a time, uh, which is not far from Montreux, and is an amazing place, uh, beautiful and by the lake and rich and splendid and ordered. Uh, every morning I would go to a bakery to get some, uh, you know, croissants or something like that. And um, I did it about three days. And then I think it was on the fourth day I went and it was a French speaking woman in the bakery. And I asked for a brioche or something. And she said, you know, she said in French, you know, you have a nerve coming in here every morning. And I thought, oh, she doesn't like English people or American people. I thought, oh, okay. And I said, well, pourquoi? Why? She said, because you don't shave. I have never seen you shave. <laughs> and I said, well, is that important? Yes. In this town, it is important if you shave every morning. What, you want the beard to look like a criminal? <laughs> I never forgot this. And then I noticed in the streets of VV and in Geneva, every single car was gleaming clean. A every car. Every window was clean, you know. And then one night, and I'm telling this for a reason, uh, I went with my then wife to a, a, a nightclub. You know, we didn't know it was, <laughs> but we went there and it was a nightclub with, with sort of, uh, not exactly strippers, but sort of rather lewd dancing, which I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mind, but <laughs> then I saw something I've never seen anywhere else. I saw, let me get this right now, a table of businessmen, who all of whom were in suits and ties, suddenly rip off their clothes, not their bottoms, but their tops, and start dancing on the tables, going crazy, <laughs> heading for the women, and they were pushed away by bouncers, and literally drinking themselves into a stupor until they had to leave. And it was half the audience. So during the day, you have this gleaming reality. And at night, the exhibition of the libido, <laughs> libido in, in the most outrageous and rather, you know, creepy way. Yeah. You know, these sort of... Anyway... But maybe they, were, they weren't they were Swiss. They were Englishmen and Americans, probably, you see. They were Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> they were Swiss. And, I, you know, because they were talking in German and French and... and uh -huh. what I, Okay, it struck me at the time, this was in the 70s, but I still remember it, that they're all so completely ordered during the day. It's the perfect society. Mm. It's neutral. Well, they, it's have, they have a living master who lives in Switzerland now. Oh? Yeah. Did you know you haven't heard of him? No. His name is Roger Federer. Ah! If you... If what you want to talk person. about symbolism of the best of Switzerland, yes, this guy is a deva. Okay, he's he does so much work on behalf of humanity. He's the world's greatest tennis player. He's still playing in his late thirties. Yeah. He's uh, his effortless style is extraordinary to experience, and so on. You can go on and on with these incredible adjectives yes. of of just the biggest damn mensch you ever saw is Roger Federer. So yeah, the Swiss. Yes. Jung and Federer. That's it. Well, you know, obviously, <laughs> okay. you know, 
he he's a, a evolved being in a Zen, a guy that gets yeah. into a Zen zone and has been in it for 21 years of playing at the highest level yeah. of the most difficult, possibly the most difficult sport yeah. imaginable. And he's a gentleman when he loses. I noticed when he lost this time at Wimbledon, you know, I mean, yes, you could say he's used to it. He's a pro, he loses, but he's every still game pissed. is... He was still you know, pissed, yeah. yeah, but he he didn't say one thing as an excuse. He spoke about the other person's complete mastery, and yeah, you're right. He is just fantastic. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I have to say, you know, yeah, a great role model. I hate that word, but gentle person and and yet a brilliant, you know, practitioner. You got to be something special to to be that great. At that and we'll be giving away uh, the beautiful Roger Federer baseball caps. Uh, you can find it on the show notes of Mind Rolling. Not. Uh, I want to talk about getting back to the uh, book. I, Boy, I we reading. ramble more than Donald. I yeah. mean. <laughs> I thought you were going to say maybe Duncan Trussell or Joe Rogan. Something uh, like that. No, we're, we can't. We're not. There, yeah. We we can. Yeah. Um, but but okay. no, please, please go on. Kundalini, just to say to everybody who has an idea, Kundalini is a mystical power located at the base of the spine, sometimes referred to as the serpent power. It's a female force connected with the Mother Earth. And in some Eastern traditions, it's revered as a goddess. Whether we are aware of this power or not, whether we believe in it or not, we are completely dependent on upon it everything we do we are only able to do thanks to kundalini the only reason we are here on earth is to learn to control this power and raise it in its entirety up the spine as it rises it activates the seven chakras and you know we'll we'll try and this might have the our young podcast might go on for a few podcasts to get all this stuff in but uh, so any that's basically and of course those seven chakras there one is at the base center which is the base of the spine called muladhara and then the sex center which is between the base of the spine and the navel is called svadhisthana and those two are where uh, and also then the solar plexus center manipurna just above the navel around power those three is where we all live ignorantly away then there's the heart center, Anhata, chest region, throat center, Vishuddha, the throat, uh, the Christ center, or third eye, Ajna, which is in the middle of the forehead, and the crown center, called Sahasra, Sahasrara, above the head. So that those are the seven centers which comprises the Kundalini, and it's uh, everything around Kundalini yoga revolves around these centers and the raising of the energy. Now, uh, this is, uh, I want to tell one little story. It's a very small story. It's around when we were in India with Maharaji. And, you know, people wanted to know how, okay, how do we do this? Okay, we're here. You're a, a guru. Come on, tell us how to how to do it. How do we raise Kundalini? And how do we... You know, should we meditating and mantras and what do we do, you know, uh, short of uh, sacrificing goats because we <laughs> kind of weren't into that. Uh, and that wasn't happening anywhere near him, that's for sure. So Ramdas directly said, Maharaji, how can we raise Kundalini? And this is a famous quote. Maharaji said, feed people. Now, of course, Ramdas has said more than once in talks or in books that was the last thing I wanted to hear. <laughs> I wanted a complex routine by which I could actually accomplish something. Feeding people? So uh, uh, I take uh, with uh, that caveat the reality of uh, people thinking that, geez, I'm going to get a book on how to do this stuff, you know, these guys mm. are talking about it. And, uh, I think it's more to the point of what I've gotten out of it is the way in which, uh, as I said in the beginning, the lens through which Jung uh, was able to interpret Kundalini Yoga in particular related to the psychological views he had, which were really so helpful to have people understand 
uh, what he calls uh, his madness to understand our true place. Um, and I think one of the core things, Dave, that he said, uh, that in practice, what this all means is becoming conscious of one's instinctual nature. Mm. And, you know, I really think that for us, that's really what uh, is so instructive for us to be able to do any of the practices that we do that we recommend on this program. Yes. Um, that many of us that uh, listen or watch, uh, that is an interest. How do I get through each day in the most conscious way without um, creating more and more karmas of habitual patterns, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? So get that instinctual nature, I mean, I think that's very much part of what he uh, really transferred regarding uh, getting into the unconscious and understanding it. So. From that point of view, I think it's super, super important. Incredibly, because I mean, he, he, yeah, just like you said, he's, he's saying everyone has this, everyone has this internal room, set of rooms, thousands of rooms, with these um, urges and and desires and 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 also aspirations in there. And again, I, I guess that's why he broke with Freud. Because, and this is such a simplification, someone could hit me in the face for saying this, but, you know, uh, Freud, Freud was <laughs> saying, you know, often, uh, you know, you're doing this because of your mother or your father, but you're also doing it because uh, you are still the recipient of atavistic sexual urges to continue the race. So, the, the, you know, the, the idea of, of, you know, original sexual communion was to further the race, and then lust came into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, as as objectification came into consciousness. In other words, a, a downward growth. I, I wanted to read something. I think this is what he ultimately felt about this. He said, this is all, I'm only quoting from the Red Book. Uh, he said, if we set a God outside of ourselves, he tears us loose from the self, since the God is more powerful than we are. Our self falls into privation. But if the God moves into the self, he snatches us from what is outside us. We arrive at singleness in ourselves. So the God becomes communal in reference to what is outside us, but single in relation to us. No one has my God, but my God has everyone, including myself. The gods of all individual men almost always have other all other men, including myself. So it is always only the one God, despite his multiplicity. You arrive at him in yourself and only through yourself seizing you. It seizes you in the advancement of your life. So, you know, the the sort of critique he had of modern society was it was, it was just, you know, kind of addicted to things outside and believed there was an outside and an inside. And had no not much interest since the Enlightenment, certainly since the 18th century, certainly not a long time before. Had no interest in examining this universe, which is our consciousness. So he's saying, well, you know, there is only one. So it gets back to the one. You know, it does get back to sub ek. It gets back to the fact Jung believed that we are all one, and therefore our neuroses, our urges. Our dangerous uh, behaviors are um, universal. So, that, and that leads to the conflict between love and judgment. And so, you know, why was he important? Well, who else was saying this? Artists, for sure, you know, but it was less useful as personal discovery. I mean, you could say that looking at a Van Gogh painting or of, of Da Vinci or Shakespeare or whatever, Beethoven was saying the same thing. But actually it wasn't, because it was still an individual showing his or her art to the world. Whereas Jung was saying, you have that within you. And I'll show you that by these paintings I'm going to do, uh, by these mandalas that I'm going to create. Uh, Raghu sent me a mandala this morning that Jung did. And, you know, it... it it isn't like a Tibetan one or, uh, or any kind of Eastern one, but it is, it is. 
it's just his own version of it, what he saw. Because, you know, the Red Book was based on 23 dreams on 23 nights. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. And, you know, the desert that he spoke of, you know, uh, was the symbolic desert of going into it like Christ did. And what did Christ see in the desert? He did not see enlightenment as such. He saw the whole deal. He saw the darkness and the light. He was tempted. The devil was a real thing to, uh, to Christ uh, in that sense. And that, you know, he went into the desert and then saw his, his oneness with, with, as he would put it, the father. And Jung was not really a Christian, but used Christian, well, he was born a Christian. Clearly, yeah. some kind. Of, I mean, he must have been some kind of Lutheran or something in Switzerland. But he saw the whole drama of the of the. Um, in fact, he says at one point, when Christ was crucified, he went into hell and became the Antichrist just to see what it was like. <laughs> you know, I mean, in other words, as an individual symbol or not symbol, um, sort of map, he was saying that we as individuals, if we examine the shadow. We stand a good chance of, of liberation. But if we deny and, and refuse to accept the shadow within ourselves and only judge it as being an objective other, which we can then destroy, we're screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things in the Kundalini book, uh, of course, we, we talked about the three lower chakras, one, the, the base being around survival and then second chakra around s procreation sexuality third around power around the navel and then if we can work on ourselves and do everything he's speaking of and everything that yoga speaks to we move into the heart chakra the fourth chakra and he says about this in the fourth chakra which is called anahata you behold the soul the purush soul a small figure that or divine self, I actually prefer per, uh, prefer divine self uh, rather than soul myself, namely that which is not identical with mere causality, nature, a mere release of energy that runs blindly with no pur purpose. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and then he goes on to, that in the anhata, a new thing comes up: the possibility of lifting himself above the emotional happenings and beholding them. Witness, right? This is what we have been talking about forever in all of our podcasts as one of the most efficacious ways in which to transform our daily relationship with our reactions, etc. And I love the way that he puts it. The possibility of lifting himself above the emotional happenings and beholding them. He discovers the purush, the divine self in his heart, the thumbling, he calls it the thumbling, smaller than small and greater than great. In the center of the heart chakra, there is again Shiva in the form of the linga, and the small flame means the first germ-like appearance of the self. I mean, mm. really terrific when you, you think yeah. about it. He's not any of this, right? Mm -hmm. He's not an Easterner. Uh, so in, in Anhata, individuation begins, mm. okay? Individuation is becoming that thing which is not the ego, and that is very strange. Therefore, nobody understands what the self is because the self is just the thing which you are not, which is not the ego. <laughs> Talk about <laughs> psychological stuff. Mm. The ego discovers itself as being a mere appendix of the self in a sort of loose connection. For the ego is always far down up your ass, basically, in the Molantara, and suddenly becomes aware of something above, up above in the fourth story in Anhata, and that is the self. Mm. Terrific. Fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it, terrific. You know, it, it's like the paradigm of meditation, you know, that, that when you're meditating, um, much of the time your thoughts are coming in. And, okay, so you could say, well, those thoughts are coming from, that, from uh, this created ego that is sort of grown too big for its boots out of survival and, and, and the first three chakras mm. and it's taken over, you know, like, whoa, 
took, took over them, all of them. And what, but then the question has to be asked and answered, or maybe not answered, but what is it that notices that when you're meditating? What is it that goes, oh, oh, I'm thinking about my lunch. And that's not the time to think about your lunch because why bother to meditate? I mean, you can think about your lunch when you're not meditating, but it comes in and I'm thinking about, you know, that, that really gorgeous woman I saw on the street and I, 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 you know, and that I have all kinds of designs upon. And I'm thinking about that money that I'm owed and it, it's relentless. And I mean, thinkers as great as Ramdas and Alan Watts and others have said to us as a way of making it less awful, this is universal. This is universal. These thoughts are there, but they are only thoughts. And the other thing that knows that they're thoughts is the, what you were talking about before, yeah. Raghu, is the witness. Yeah. And that witness is the individuation of the self, but not the ego. Right. And that right. divisive, I find it in meditation fascinating because, you know, you can even, they say you should never say I had a good meditation. You know, you should never say that. And I understand that. But there are times when a meditation is much more flowingly non-invasive, I mean, in terms of what comes in, than other times. And I've even found that if you, if, if I, because um, I am a meditator, I, you know, if I, if I miss a day or two or something, they come back stronger. They come back stronger. Uh -huh. So it proves yeah. that they haven't gone away. I mean, the, the, the biggest, I mean, Jung is really good about this, you know, and, and so are other great, great analysts of, of the mind and the heart that you can't pretend that they go away unless you're Ramana Maharshi or Ramakrishna or, 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 or other Babas. Maybe. Well, they, they're not, they're not pretending anything. No, okay? they're not pretending. They're anything. living in that non-dual place where right. the, the thoughts are coming through, but there's absolutely no, relationship of attachment whatsoever there's no st not even the tiniest sticky thing which is the per you know that's really uh, we hope that we are going to after much much practice some of that stickiness will fall away for uh, from uh, you know, for us and yeah. but these kind of beings have you know f eight billion gazillion lifetimes of work and they yeah, that stuff isn't sticking, the, and the desire systems are not sticking, yeah. I mean, Jung didn't really get into that because he wasn't ready, I suppose, or, or he was strictly in the psychological, you know, sort of frame. But um, he suggested it in other ways that, you know, you could work. There, there was a job to be done by individuals that had not really been emphasized in the West because the West you know, the colonizing West, I think he would probably agree, you know, the, the sort of European countries that went into Africa, South America, North America, China, Southeast Asia, you know, with a view to converting them to Christianity while creating a terrific business. After all, the British in India was were, were originally called, well, the British um, Empire Company or something, I, I've forgotten, but East. it was a company. Yeah, East India. Right, yeah. right. So there were Christian missionaries going out to convert the ignorant and thereby uh, not being in the slightest interested in what these great cultures had cultivated in the true sense of culture over centuries from Lao Tzu and Buddha and the rest of them uh, uh, and thousands of, of, of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I mean, it's been mind blowing when we think that we had the right to go there and just go, okay, these people are crazy. And they don't know about steel ships and battleships and how to take over places yeah. and how to convert these ignorant people who are naked for God's sake. The guy's just wearing a dhoti. Oh my God. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And you know, it is big because it's still in our lives. This is still part of the dialectic that we're involved in, um, you know, in, in 2018. Uh, Jung knew that this was not going to work if we were continuing to objectify the universe, that uh, we had to feel that it was within us and without us. As George Harrison said, mm -hmm. if no one said it before him, he certainly said it in that song, right? Uh, I'm within you, without you. Yeah. Um, Jung, you know, intensely experienced this. 
It wasn't some sort of theory. When he put himself out for those years, when he was very traumatized by the split from Freud, because I think they were really good friends, but he also was traumatized by the fact that he felt alone in this in this um, uh, pursuit of the one, mm. of mm. the collective unconscious, yeah. which you know is I don't know whether the word unconscious applies anymore. Uh, it's more like saying collective consciousness, the one. Two words sir, that you don't need. One. Yeah. Here's what uh, he actually at some point in this uh, gave a uh, just a, a general kind of view of the difference between how an Indian person, a Hindu person thinks and a uh -huh. Westerner thinks. The Hindu thinks in terms of the great light. His thinking starts not from a personal but rather from a cosmic center, the ajna. His thinking begins with the Brahman and ours with the ego. Our thought starts out with the individual and goes out into the general. The Hindu begins with the general and works down to the individual. Mm. From this aspect, everything is reversed. From this aspect, we realize that everywhere we are still enclosed within the world of causality, that in terms of the chakra, we are not high up, but absolutely down below. <laughs> we are sitting in a hole in the pelvis of the world, and our heart center uh, is, is a heart in the... Uh, in the muladhara, which is the, the center at the base of our spine. Our culture represents the conscious held prisoner in the muladhara, in the uh, survival base consciousness, right? To <laughs> pelvis of the world. Hmm. Looked at from, the, from, this, from that aspect, everything is still... Mulhadara. In other words, everything is about survival and mm. uh, duality and polarization and so on. So that well, maybe d does that tie in, Raga, with Maharaji's um, you know, coming to liberation via feeding people means helping them to get beyond the survival. Because when you're starving, you, you I think it's been said many times. Yeah. You you can't. It's very hard to to you know take any of those steps because you're starving, and yeah. you, you're you're ill essentially. So when he said feed the people, feed people, uh, and that's not something that's only Maharaji said that, but you know one would maybe have expected all kinds of explanations of you yeah, know. I you know, but no, he said, you, other people must survive in order for you to even have any concept of a body self function in life. And I think that the action that you would take in feeding people is what Kundu ultimately puts you out of your ego mind and into your heart chakra immediately because there's caring, there's mm. reaching out, there's generosity, there's compassion. And as soon as you do that action, that completely turns your whole world topsy-turvy from, from the me, 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 me. And it's all about me and what do I need? Uh, what do I need to get enlightened? I need to get my kundalini, kundalini rose, rosen. I mean, the action that one takes just in the simple act of feeding someone. Of course, feeding someone doesn't necessarily mean food. It means love. Right. It means you know, a friendship, uh, anything. Mm. And as soon as you do that, and everybody knows that, as soon as you give a shit about somebody else, your world changes. Mm. Mm. And exactly. I, I really, you know, think that the, that that's a lot of what, you know, that's basically what he was telling us. You know, and that will transform you. Not sitting in a cave doing, you know, meditative uh, practice. So, um, yeah, I think. And His Holiness says the same thing. Yeah. Also. You know, with all the incredible learned uh, stuff that he, he knows, and if you go to one of his things, you know that he knows it. Um, still, at the end, he says, if, if men and women don't learn the art of compassion and ergo the art of happiness, mm. um, 
all the rest of it is 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 yeah. pretty irrelevant. Yeah. And and it, but, but to get back to Jung, it is amazing that this Western Swiss. I, I if anybody's Swiss, I'm not anti-Swiss. I really <laughs> loved it. I loved being there. Yeah, and we've but, talked about Roger Federer. Come on. Yeah, we did. Uh, but we, I also talked about the businessmen. Yeah, oh, the trying, businessmen trying trying ripping their clothes the off. And, yeah. By the way, they were screaming. That was the other thing. Everybody <laughs> talks very quietly in, 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 in <laughs> Switzerland. You know, you, you, you're quiet and understated. And they were going crazy. And so what was that about? It was about repression, obviously, yeah. you know, and I don't want to judge them because, you know, I was sitting quietly there. Maybe I should have been screaming. You, but, you um, should have been on that table ripping your Well, I was with off. my wife, oh. so I didn't. Maybe if I had been on my own, I would have been on the table <laughs> but or under the table, yeah. actually. But, you know, just to get back to Jung's place in, hist- in the history of, of whatever, um, it is remarkable that this human being who had uh, an upbringing which was not particular. Actually, his, his father was a doctor, I guess, or some kind of person in that field. And he came in a fairly enlightened family. But the culture that he came up in had no interest or knowledge of the East. And when you really think about it, living in America now, despite a a yoga studio on every street and um, a vast library of books and stuff to read and, you know, all this wonderful stuff, uh, the vast majority of, of us uh, are still in that what you called before, that survival place. And that much of the political dialectic, such as it is, is about economics rather than kindness. You know, and they say, well, you know, you, you know Trump is, is a lunatic, but we've got low unemployment and the stock market has risen way over 20,000. You know, it's great. We're, things are working. And maybe that is the job of the politician. Is that's the job is to structure it so people don't starve and have health care. Unfortunately, that is not his philosophy. But there is a place, I guess, for uh, a structured um, modus operandi to make people happier via making sure that people can eat and get uh, and get health care when they're sick, um, which is not the case in the world. Forget America. I mean, you know, go to um, Zimbabwe, you know, or um you know, uh, many places where people are suffering terribly from starvation and from corruption. Mm. And uh, Jung again would be saying, well, that's the result of a, a false view of self. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, which, which we, you know, it is amazing. You think about, it, you know, it's been 50 years since, um, you know, uh, that explosion of consciousness in the 60s. And the like of which really hasn't recurred. I mean, there are outbreaks, you know, but it was it, it, the whole thing. You know, you go from Roger McGuinn and the Birds to Captain Beefheart to Joni Mitchell to the Beatles to Timothy Leary to Alan Watts to, my God, suddenly, boom, bang, this this big bang of consciousness, of, of consciousness, of consciousness happened. And there was Jung a half century before with the same urges to get out of the envelope or the box, the claustrophobic box of post-Cartesian thought. You know, I think we're at the end here of our no. sojourn. <laughs> no, we haven't touched it. Well, we're gonna, we'll have to do several on this, I know. Uh, but um, there, you want to hear something really wild? Um, he talks yeah. about, in this book, about the wind. Mm. Okay. The wind, in many languages, there's the same word for wind and spirit. Spiritus, for instance. Mm-hmm. And spirare means to blow or breathe. Animus, spirit, comes from the Greek animos, wind. And pneuma, spirit, is also a Greek word for wind. In Arabic, mm. ruch is the wind or soul of the spirit. And in Hebrew, roch means spirit and wind. The connection between wind and spirit is due to the fact that the spirit was thought originally to be the breath, the air one breathes out or expires. When a person's last breath, with a person's last breath, his spirit leaves the body. So it would be either a magic wind or the sun that lifts you up. And where do we find the the two things coming together? 
uh, and he goes on from there. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, mm-hmm. okay, what's the biggest thing we got when we went to India with Maharaji? Hanuman, son of the wind. Mm. Wow. Uh, what a connection there. Mm. I was like, son of the wind, spirit. And that's what he, that's the thing that literally flew over that ocean. Hanuman flew over that ocean to America in the guise of many Westerners that met with Neem Karoli Baba. And in fact, uh, there's a, a wonderful, incredible Murti statue of Hanuman in New Mexico, in Taos, at Maharaji's only temple in America that is actually in the midst of getting a wonderful new housing in this beautiful uh, new gathering room and temple for him. I'm glad I'm mentioning that. Uh, Anybody who is interested in supporting, who loves Hanuman like we do, um, uh, it'll be in the show notes how to get in touch with. It's nkbashram.org. This just came to me, folks. So it's, yeah, this is our... uh, our uh, commercial for the for this podcast because we're ending with Jung describing exactly mm. what Hanuman is. Mm. How about that? I, I like that very much. Yeah, so it's great. great. Yeah. yeah, we have so much more. I think we'll have to just do another one. It's, we'll see yeah. you, you people out there. If you like this whole chatting <laughs> yes. about Jung. We got a lot more where this came from, and we can do more. So you send us a, a note, uh, and uh, you know. And if you don't like it, just stay quiet. Quiet. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're too <laughs> sensitive, and we can't really hang yeah, uh, no uh, criticism. You know, I'll think about it for a month. Uh, yeah. I won't sleep. Yeah, really. What did we do wrong? Oh, a lot. <laughs> So great to have you back. All right. Well, Thank if you. you're as you getting uh, feeling better and so on, then you know we can continue, yeah. huh? Well, definitely. It's just uh, well, that's you know, good. Even of... making a fist is great. That's yeah, it is really great, actually. Yeah, since and, I and, really and, know, I've been you know, getting atrophied in some way. It always helps you um, understand that you're not most of the time grateful for what is. I, it sounds very sanctimonious, but it, yeah, it, you know, yeah. when you break a bone, you understand. Okay, I'm not going to be able to do a lot of the things that I take for granted. It's mm-hmm. really nice in a way, although it makes but, me uh, want to scream in the night. But nevertheless, <laughs> your brain hasn't atrophied, has it? No, no more than um, it has been normal. Yeah, uh, right. you know. But <laughs> no, mm-hmm. no. anyway, it's great to do this. I, yeah, you know, I, thanks, I, I hope I hope the young scholars. Um, oh, yeah, don't get after us. We know from yeah. nothing, okay? Yeah. This know. is just a, a lark, <laughs> and we saw some things we liked, and I, I went to a psychiatrist for a while that was a Jungian. That's it, okay? Yes. Don't don't belabor us, okay? All right, there you go. This is Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network. Thank you, David. We shall Thank you. see you next week. Love to everybody.